वेलकम एवरी वन टू लेक्चर नंबर नाइन ऑन नॉन लीनियर डायनेमिक सिस्टम्स सो वी हैड स्टार्टेड विथ लासल इनवेरियंस प्रिंसिपल द लास्ट लेक्चर सो लेट लेट एस जस्ट क्विकली रिव्यू दिस सो सपोज ओमेगा इज अ कॉम्पैक्ट सेट दैट इज पॉजिटिवली इनवेरियंट एंड सपोज वी हैव फाउंड अ फंक्शन वी दैट इज सी वन सी वन मीन्स डिफ्रेंशियबल एंड द डेरेटिव इज कंटिन्यूस सच दैट this v satisfies v dot is less than or equal to 0 on this set omega for this v we will now find a set e such that v dot equal to 0 on this set e and let m be the largest invariant set in e largest invariant set in e means it is invariant under the dynamics of this dynamical system it is contained in e and it is the largest such set in other words any other subset of e that has satisfies these properties is also contained in m if these conditions are satisfied then every solution starting in omega approaches this set m as t tends to infinity so approach a set we uh, had seen this as a definition so what the lassalle invariance principle says that every solution starting in the set approaches m no in other words for every initial condition the trajectory converges to m what is the meaning of converging to a set so the distance of a point p from a set is defined as the distance of p to different different points in m and the shortest such distance so this is a definition of distance of a point p from the set m now as x evolves as a function of time x of t is a point and we look at the distance of x of t from the set m and this distance decreases as t tends to infinity that is a statement of the lassalle invariance principle so we had already encountered the situation of the pendulum example in which the natural energy function to take did not satisfy strictly less than 0 so let us do this example again so we uh, this is what we call as friction this is the situation of a pendulum the original differential equation was of second order which was equal to like this this differential equation of second order we converted to a first order differential equation two first order differential equations by introducing x2 so x1 is the same as x and x2 is the derivative of x1 and these two first order differential equations we will now study the equilibrium point and the stability properties of the equilibrium point so for this dynamical system we will now see x2 and minus sin x1 minus b x2 this equal to 0 0 this gives us x1 equal to 0 and x2 equal to 0 as one of the equilibrium points yeah of course we could have x1 equal to pi also that corresponds to the pendulum standing upwards which we know is unstable we can also obtain that as a conclusion by linearizing about that point and checking that the eigen values are at least one of them is in the open right half plane that we will keep as an exercise what we will now check is whether this equilibrium point whether 0 0 is stable asymptotically stable this is what we will check now for this purpose we will take the lyapunov function coming as the energy of the system so take p of x equal to 1 minus cos of x1 why because this is the potential energy <coughs> so what was our x1 variable this is our pendulum when it undergoes a deviation of angle x1 yeah so this is the angle the time how much does it get raised the amount by which it gets raised is the potential energy accumulated into the system and that turns out to be 1 minus cos x1 of course multiplied by the mass and the gravitational acceleration g 
but we have uh, considered a model where those parameters are not arising. This can be considered as normalization of the equations or as normalization of the mass to 1. This is only the potential energy. The other energy term is actually x2 square by 2. Let us check what happens if we take just x2 square. Yeah, so, this is not really energy because this is not kinetic energy. The second term is not kinetic energy, but it is twice the kinetic energy. So, let us check what happens to V dot of x. So, this turns out to be del V by del x times f of x and when we evaluate this del V by del x is a rho vector in which the first component here is the derivative of this with respect to x 1 which is exactly sin of x 1 and the derivative of this with respect to x 2 that is 2 x 2 times f of x. What was f of x? The first component was x 2, second component was minus sin x 1 minus b x 2 and when we multiply this product, this is like inner product, we get x 2 sin x 1 minus 2 times x 2 sin x 1 minus 2 b x 2 square. So, this is what we get as v dot of x. So, is this quantity positive or negative? That is the next thing we will investigate. So, we got v dot of x was equal to this term is well behaved, but the other term is this is our x 1, this is our x 2. So, one term of course, does not change sign, it is always negative or equal to 0, but the other term x 1 and x 2 sin of x 1 has the same sign as x 1 close to x 1 equal to 0, but x 2 times this can change its sign depending on which quadrant it is and hence for small values of x 1 and x 2 in other words close to the origin, we are not able to say that v dot of x is less than or equal to 0, this is not satisfied close to 0 comma 0. This one can check oneself in order to check oneself, one could first ignore this particular term. Why we can ignore this term? Because this is to put b equal to 0 just means that we have a pendulum without friction and for the pendulum without friction, we know that the system is stable. By intuition, we want to obtain that as a conclusion from the Lyapunov's theorem of stability and for that purpose, this particular quantity certainly changes sign. Yeah, it will have different signs depending on x 1 x 2 on in on each of these 4 quadrants and hence this v dot does not satisfy less than or equal to 0. So, this is not a valid Lyapunov function. Why? Because it is a Lyapunov candidate, it is positive definite, but it is not decreasing, it is not non increasing around the origin. So, let us go back to our Lyapunov function and make a small change here. We will now divide this by 2, this perhaps we have already verified once. So, this now is indeed the kinetic energy. So, by doing this, we do not get this 2 term here and we remove this also here because of which this term now cancels out and we have v dot of x. Now, it is indeed less than or equal to 0. Why? Because v dot of x was equal to minus b x 2 square. So, this at least proves that 0 comma 0 is stable. However, this had not helped us to prove that the origin is asymptotically stable even though we by intuition we know that the equilibrium point is in fact asymptotically stable because we have friction which continuously dissipates off the energy. So, how do we obtain that? This particular function Lyapunov candidate does not help us. However, we can use Lassalle's invariance principle for the same Lyapunov function. So, construct the set E set of all x such that v dot of x was equal to 0. In other words, minus b x 2 square equal to 0, it gives us set of all points where x 2 is equal to 0. Yeah? So, this x 2 equal to 0 is nothing but the x 1 axis. The x 1 axis 
is a set of all points where rate of change of the Lyapunov function is equal to 0. So, this is our set E. Now, we want to look at the set M which is subset of of E invariant invariant under the dynamics of the system and largest such set largest such set largest such set which satisfies that it is a subset of E and it is invariant under the dynamics of the system. So, uh, how will we find the largest such set? We will look for what values of x1 and x2 are subset of E and are also invariant. When we try to do this, we will automatically get the set of all x1, x2 points that are invariant and contained in E and hence it will be the largest such set. So, x2 equal to 0 is the requirement that the set M is contained in E. Now, we will put this in x1 dot equal to x2 and x2 dot equal to minus sin x1 minus b x2. When we put x2 equal to 0, we get x1 dot equal to 0. We also put x2. So, x of t is contained in set E, which means x2 of t is equal to 0 always, is uniformly equal to 0, equivalently equal to 0 identically equal to 0. These are the different ways we interpret this symbol, this equation. So, if some particular value of x as a function of time is always equal to 0, it is like a constant function which automatically means that x2 dot is also equal to 0 identically. So, when we put that x2 dot equal to 0, then we also get sin of x1 equal to 0. And this implies that sin of x1 equal to 0 which of course, we know happens at either the vertically down position which is x 1 equal to 0 or the vertically up position which is x 1 equal to pi. Since we are interested about the stability properties of the position of the point 0 comma 0, we get hmm, this is of interest. Since we are interested at this point, we get that m is just the point 0 comma 0. Yeah, when we ask the question inside the set E, which are all those points which are invariant under the dynamics of F, that time we took the set E, which, which means we put the equation x2 equal to 0 and we uh, studied invariance. By invariance, for invariance we put the fact that x2 is always equal to 0, which, got, which means x2 dot also equal to 0. When we substituted that back here, we got sin of x1 also equal to 0. This term was already 0, this term we now got equal to 0 because of which we obtained that sin of x1 equal to 0 and which means that we this can happen at the point pi comma 0 also. The first component is equal to 0 that is one of interest which is vertically down position. So, we have obtained that the, the set of all invariance points that satisfies the property that it is invariant and subset of E gives us only this point and this is the largest such set. Yeah, any other set would not satisfy the equations. We looked at looked for all the points that satisfy the equations and got this point. So, in other words, we have obtained that M is just the set, just the point 0 comma 0. So, what is the meaning? So, by so by Lassalle's invariance principle, by Lassalle's invariance principle, x of t converges to the set M which is just 0 comma 0. Yeah. So, this, this in other words proves that origin is not just stable which we already concluded from the Lyapunov's theorem of stability, but we in fact got that the origin is asymptotically stable. So, this concludes proof of the statement that the origin is asymptotically stable by using what principle? Not by using Lyapunov's theorem of asymptotic stability, but by using Lassalle's invariance principle, 
which we used to conclude that the set M has just one point, the origin, and by Lassalle's invariance principle, the trajectories x of t converge to M, and hence the origin is ori asymptotically stable. Now we will investigate whether the linearized system at this point is also asymptotically stable. So consider again x1 dot equal to x2 and x2 dot equal to minus sin x1 minus b x2. So x dot is equal to this can be written as f1 of x and f2 of x as a vector. So what is the linearization? Okay, we have already checked that the equilibrium point of interest is 0 comma 0. We have checked that this is an equilibrium point. Now what is this linearized system? It is this particular matrix evaluated at x equal to 0 comma 0. So, let us find what this matrix is. The term that comes here is the derivative of f 1 with respect to x 1. So, in f 1 which is this equation x 1 does not come at all. In other words, the derivative of f 1 with respect to x 1 is 0. What is the derivative of f 1 with respect to x 2? That is the term that comes here that is precisely equal to 1. Why? Because f 1 of x is equal to x 2. So, derivative of f 1 of x with respect to x 2 is equal to 1. What is the derivative of f 2 with respect to x 1? So, where all does x 1 appear in this equation? It appears only here. In other words, derivative of minus sin x 1 with respect to x 1 that is co minus cos x 1. What is the derivative of this term with respect to x2? So x2 does not come here, it, it come it appears only here, and so we put minus b here. This as expected is a matrix, but it depends on x1 and x2, it depends only on x2 in this case. So we are now required to evaluate this at x equal to 0 at the origin. So, which means that in the in the first two entries x1, x2 do not appear it appears only here when you put x1 equal to 0 we get minus 1 and of course b is greater than 0 so let us check how the eigen values of this matrix look so upon checking eigen, one one can uh, do the calculations and check that eigen values eigen values of a are in the open left half complex plane one can check that by using the fact that b is greater than 0, the eigenvalues of that particular matrix we wrote are both in the open left half plane, which means that the origin is asymptotically stable. And for a linearized system, if A is Hurwitz, if the origin of the linearized system has all eigenvalues in the open left half plane, then we know that the nonlinear system's equilibrium point is also asymptotically stable. However, that Lyapunov function could not help us with that. So, can we find another Lyapunov function? After all, the Lyapunov uh, theorem was only a sufficient condition for stability and asymptotic stability. Since we already know that the equilibrium point is asymptotically stable, can we find another Lyapunov function to prove, to show asymptotic stability? The energy function already helped us to prove stability, but we want to prove asymptotic stability. So, we will consider finding a Lyapunov function for the linearized system. In other words, find p greater than 0 such that a transpose p plus p a is equal to q for q a negative definite matrix. This is a problem that we will solve now. Why? Because this particular Lyapunov function for the linearized system will also help as a Lyapunov function for the nonlinear system. So, we can in fact choose for linear systems because A is Hurwitz for any Q we will be able to find such a P. So, take Q equal to minus 1 0 0 minus 1. Yeah? In other words, th this Q will correspond to our V dot of x. So, the corresponding V dot of x will turn out to be equal to minus x 1 square minus x 2 square. Why? Because v dot of x is nothing but x transpose q x. 
for linear systems. So when we put this particular q, we will get precisely this and this we know is negative definite. It is strictly less than 0 for all x1, x2 except of course x1 equal to 0 and x2 equal to 0. So for this particular q, we will now look for a p such that find find p such that a transpose p plus p a is equal to this q because that particular a is Hurwitz the p that we will obtain from this equation will or will turn out to be positive definite matrix this is the equation that we will solve now so notice that a was equal to 0 1 minus 1 minus b for the purpose of solving we could take b equal to 1 this is the rate at which energy decreases due to friction and this uh, is required to be positive. So, we have taken b equal to 1. What do we get by solving uh, for solving for p? We will assume p has these entries yeah? p 1, p 2, p is a, is a symmetric matrix hence this entry is also equal to p 2 and p 3. So, when we do a transpose p plus p a that time we get this to be equal to this is a transpose what is written here is a transpose times p1 p2 p2 p3 plus the same matrix p1 p2 p2 p3 times uh, times a which was equal to 0 1 minus 1 1 so we will now evaluate this this is equal to minus p2 minus p3 this is p1 plus p2 and here we have p2 plus p3 this is minus p2 minus p3 and p1 plus p2 and p2 plus p3 so now we will equate this to q and while doing that so, uh, we can add these two matrices to get finally A transpose P plus P A is equal to minus 2 P 2 P 1 plus P 2 minus P 3 here we get the same thing P 1 plus P 2 minus P 3 and here we get 2 P 2 plus 2 P 3. So, since P was symmetric we have got this particular matrix to be symmetric and that is the reason that we should be choosing q also to be symmetric and we have chosen q to be equal to let us find values p1 p2 p3 a particular theorem we already saw claims that this system of equations is solvable yeah so there are only three entries to three equations 1 2 and 3 why because this entry equal to this is the same equation as this entry equal to 0 so let us put minus 2 p2 equal to minus 1 p1 plus p2 minus p3 is equal to 0 and finally 2 p2 plus 2 p3 equal to minus 1. So the first equation just tells that p2 is equal to 1 by 2 which when we substitute in the last equation we get p3 was equal to minus 1 minus 2 p2 yeah? so minus 2 times p2 is nothing but minus 1 again which gives us p3 equal to so we have taken a equal to uh, 0 1 uh, let us go back to this equation we have got a equal to uh, 0 1 minus 1 minus b and we have put b equal to 1 and let us now take p equal to p1 p2 p2 p3 we have taken p to be symmetric that is why we have taken the same entry here so let us solve for a transpose p plus p a this gives us for a transpose we, we will write 0 minus 1 1 minus 1 times p1 p2 p2 p3 plus the same matrix p1 p2 
थ्री टू पी थ्री टाइम्स ए विच इज इक्वल टू जीरो वन माइनस वन माइनस वन एंड वेन वी सॉल्व दिस सो दिस वेन वी डू वी गेट माइनस पी टू माइनस पी थ्री पी वन माइनस पी टू एंड पी टू माइनस पी थ्री प्लस दिस पर्टिकुलर मेट्रिक्स प्रोडक्ट वेन वी इवेल्युएट वी गेट माइनस पी टू माइनस पी थ्री पी वन माइनस पी टू पी टू माइनस पी थ्री एंड वेन वी एड दीज टू मेट्रिस वी गेट माइनस टू पी टू पी वन माइनस पी टू माइनस पी थ्री पी वन माइनस पी टू माइनस पी थ्री एंड फाइनली टू पी टू माइनस टू पी थ्री या सो दिस मेट्रिक्स वे फाइनली गॉट इज नथिंग बट ए ट्रांसफोर्स पी प्लस पी टाइम्स ए नाउ वी विल इक्वेट दिस टू क्यू सो वी हैड ऑलरेडी टेकन सो नोटिस दैट दिस मेट्रिक्स is symmetric because p we have because we have taken p to be symmetric this matrix has been obtained to be symmetric and hence it is important that this matrix be equal to a q which also should be assumed to be symmetric so we have taken q to be equal to minus 1 0 0 minus 1 so when we equate this matrix to q then we have it appears like four equations this entry equal to minus 1 This entry equal to zero. This entry equal to zero is again the same equation. So it is not really four equations, but three. What is the last equation? This entry equal to minus one. So these four equations now we will write here. So we have minus two p two equal to minus one. P one minus p two minus p three equal to zero, and two p two minus two p three equal to minus one. so the first equation gives us 1 by 2 which when we substitute into the last equation we get 2p3 is equal to 2p2 plus 1 which was equal to 2 yeah when we put p2 equal to half here we get 2 and these p1 p2 and p3 when we substitute into the second equation we get p1 equal to P two plus P three, which was equal to two point five. Yeah. So what is our matrix P as a result of this? The matrix P was equal to P one, P two, P two, P three. So P one has been obtained to be equal to two point five. P two was equal to zero point five, which is the same entry here. And finally, P P three, which was equal to two. So the claim is that this matrix P that we have obtained is positive definite because A was Hurwitz and Q was negative definite. We can check this. So P greater than zero. How will we check this? One way to check that a matrix is positive definite is that all the principal minors, all the leading principal minors. So for a square symmetric matrix. this is a 1 by 1 minor it is a principal minor because it is uh, ha has the symmetric rows and columns taken to construct that sub matrix and only the leading ones so we take only this now and every such matrix we take and look at the determinant and each of these determinants should be a positive number that is a necessary and sufficient condition for this matrix p to be a positive definite matrix so let us do that check for this here we have to take only two determinants the first one by one determinant is nothing but 2.5 yeah p11 the first sub matrix is equal to 2.5 that is greater than 0 what about the determinant of the whole matrix the next leading principal minor is nothing but the whole matrix p so the determinant of the whole matrix is 2 into 2.5 minus 0.5 square which is equal to 5 minus 0.25 is equal to 4.75 that is positive so because both the first leading 1 by 1 minor and the second leading 2 by 2 minor are both positive determinant 
this means that the matrix P is positive definite. So, if we had taken the Lyapunov function coming from this P for the linearized system, so what is the Lyapunov function? It is x transpose P x in which P was in which the matrix P was the one that we just now obtained. If we take this as our Lyapunov function, then the origin turns out to be asymptotically stable by Lyapunov's theorem of asymptotic stability. And the same Lyapunov function will also help us in proving asymptotic stability of the nonlinear system's equilibrium point, which happens to be the origin again. But if we had started with this Lyapunov function, then we would not have required Lassell's invariance principle because the Lyapunov function theorem itself would have claimed stated that the equilibrium point is asymptotically stable. Unlike the energy function, unlike the physical energy that we had taken which helped us to prove only stability by well, Lyapunov's theorem of stability. So, uh, this completes Lyapunov analysis, we have seen some uh, solved examples also. We can uh, have another set of problems which we will use as exercises. We will now move on to the next topic which is about periodic orbits. Why? Because periodic orbits are an important part in the uh, context of building oscillators. So, uh, before we move to that topic, there is one other slide that we had skipped. So, uh, the Lassell's invariance principle which we saw in detail and also saw an example is different from Lyapunov's theorem in two ways. The first way is unlike the Lyapunov theorem, the Lassell's invariance principle does not require the function v to be positive definite. Yeah? Notice that we did not assume that v was positive definite. Second, the positive invariant set that we had constructed in the proof of the Lyapunov theorem, that set omega was constructed using the Lyapunov function v. Here we are assuming that we already have a positive invariant set. In fact, it is that is the reason that we are not assuming v as positive definite because on a compact set omega, we are uh, v always achieves its minimum and we can subtract that minimum from the function v here by which we can always obtain another function v that indeed is positive definite. Okay, uh, we will also see an application of Lassell's invariance principle. So, there are well known results that are that turn out to be a special case of the Lassell's invariance principle. So, one of them is Barbashin Krasovsky's theorems. Uh, what is the statement of the theorem? So, suppose x dot equal to f of x is a system in which x can have many components, x is an element of R n and suppose the origin is an equilibrium point. Suppose there exists a function v from a domain d to R which is continuously differentiable and suppose v is positive definite function. In other words, v of x is greater than 0 for all x except origin x equal to 0 and also v satisfies that it is less than or equal to 0 on the domain d. Construct the set M that is made up of all the points where V dot is equal to 0. Suppose this particular M has the property that the only solution that can remain inside M is x t identically equal to 0, then the origin is asymptotically stable. Notice that this is precisely the situation that had happened for the pendulum example with friction. So, the barbashin krasovsky theorem is a more general statement to this effect. What can we speak uh, say about global asymptotic stability of that equilibrium point we just now claim to be asymptotically stable? If V is radially unbounded further in addition to the abo above assumptions, if V is also radially unbounded, then the origin is in fact globally asymptotically stable. So, this particular theorem we already saw for the case of a pendulum as far as asymptotic stability is concerned. Of course, the pendulum example, it is not globally asymptotically stable simply because there are other equilibrium points. However, the barbashin krasovsky theorem says that if V were radially unbounded, then the origin is in fact globally asymptotically stable. One can check that the Lyapunov function V we had used for the case of the pendulum example with friction that is not going to be radially unbounded. Otherwise, the origin there would have been globally asymptotically stable according to this theorem. Okay, now, we come to the other topic about periodic orbits. For this purpose, we will study periodic orbits in more detail for a plane where the trajectory evolves in a plane. So, in other words, at each time instant, 
at, at each time instant x of t is an element of R2, it has two components only. So, what is the objective? The objective is to design robust and stable oscillators. So, what is robust about this and what is stable about this? We want that the amplitude and frequency of the oscillations are not too sensitive to the initial conditions and are not too sensitive to the system parameters. So, as we had noted at the beginning of this of these lectures, only nonlinear systems can help. Why is that? Because linear systems first of all are very sensitive to are sensitive to initial conditions. In other words, if we start with a different initial condition, then the amplitude is different. Of course, for linear systems the frequency remains the same, but the amplitude is different. Moreover, the fact that there are periodic orbits is extremely sensitive to system parameters. In other words, the eigenvalues are on the imaginary axis. For small changes in the system parameters, the eigenvalues could be in the right half plane or in the left half plane, which means that we might have either no periodic orbits and all trajectories go to 0 or the trajectories could become unbounded and there is again absence of periodic orbits. In other words, linear systems are at the brink of instability and hence periodic orbits are extremely sensitive to the system parameters. So, for non-linear systems the question arises how to even claim that there are periodic orbits for this system of equations. So, one extremely important result in this context is the Poincare Bendixson criteria. So, what does the criteria tell? So, consider the system x dot is equal to f of x in which note, note that x has only two components, the x here has only two components and suppose the set m, suppose there is a set m which is a compact set, it is a closed and bounded subset of the plane. Suppose m has the property that m contains no equilibrium points or m could, could contain an equilibrium point such that that equilibrium point is either unstable focus or an unstable node. So, there are two situations for the second bullet. The first case is m contains no equilibrium points. The second situation is that when we linearize at that equilibrium point, if there is an equilibrium point, then at most one equilibrium point is allowed and at when we linearize at that equilibrium point, then the linearized system has an unstable focus or an unstable node. In other words, both the eigenvalues of the matrix A, which we get by linearizing at this equilibrium point are unstable. Uh, both the eigenvalues are in the open right half complex plane. So, suppose m has this property, further suppose m is also positively invariant. Yeah, if m satisfies these three conditions, that it is a compact set, it is positively invariant and either m has no equilibrium points or at most one which is unstable. These three conditions are sufficient to ensure that m contains a periodic orbit. Yeah. So, under these assumptions the Poincare Bendixson criteria claims that there is m is guaranteed to contain a periodic orbit. So, what is the intuition behind this? So, m is positively invariant and compact. In other words, trajectories that start inside m remain inside m for all future time and since m is compact, these trajectories are all bounded. They cannot become unbounded because they do not even leave m and m is bounded. Further, these bounded trajectories will have to approach periodic orbits or they can approach equilibrium points. As t tends to infinity, what happens to all these bounded trajectories? They either approach the equilibrium points or they approach periodic orbits. These are the only two possibilities. Why? Because the trajectories are all bounded and they exist for all future time. Now, if we rule out existence of any equilibrium points inside M, then we are forced to have a periodic orbit. This is what Poincare Bendixson criteria says. Secondly, even if M had a periodic, even if M had an equilibrium point, but if that were unstable, then the trajectories could not be converging to them or trajectories could not be converging to the equilibrium point. So, we would have an periodic orbit even if M had an equilibrium point which was unstable in that case. So, these three conditions on M ensure that there is a periodic orbit. So, please note that this is only a sufficient condition for existence of a periodic orbit. 
of course there can also be a continuum of, there can be non unique periodic orbits there can also be a continuum of periodic orbits which we will see very soon another important criteria in this situation is the so called bendixson criteria so what does this criteria say it is a sufficient condition please note with which conditions are necessary which conditions are sufficient the bendixson criteria is a sufficient condition for non existence of periodic orbits yeah it is a sufficient condition for non existence of periodic orbits that are fully contained inside a region so what is the criteria if on a simply connected region d of the plane so uh, we will quickly uh, see what a simply connected region is so on a simply connected region of the plane if this particular expression here yeah satisfies the condition that it is not identically zero and it does not change its sign if these conditions are satisfied then the system of equations x dot is equal to f of x has no periodic orbits lying entirely in d so inside the region d we check that this quantity is not always equal to zero and it also doesn't change sign inside d if those two properties are satisfied by this particular function then there cannot be any periodic orbit lying completely in d so please note that it is only non existence fully contained inside d of periodic orbits that is being guaranteed by the criteria so x dot is equal to x1 dot x2 dot which is equal to f1 of x f2 of x so this is our dynamical system as i said we are considering evolution of trajectories in a plane so x has only two components x1 and x2 and hence this differential equation has only two equations inside this so now we differentiate the first one we differentiate f1 with respect to x1 and to that we add the partial derivative of f2 with respect to x2 so note that f1 depends on x which is x1 and x2 so f1 can depend on x1 also and x2 also and similarly f2 can depend on x1 and x2 hence we have partial derivatives of f1 and f2 here partial derivative of f1 with respect to x1 partial derivative of f2 with respect to x2 this particular quantity is some some function yeah suppose that function is called g which depends on both x1 and x2 so what does the bendixson criteria say that this particular quantity you check check that g of x1 comma x2 is not identically zero in d so d is a region inside this region this quantity is not identically zero in other words there is at least one point x1 x2 where this is not equal to zero as soon as this is not equal to zero at least at a single point it means this is not identically zero in d it is allowed to be zero at a few points at several points however it should not be equal to zero in at all the points in d this is that is a statement that this is not identically zero also check that the sign sign of g the sign of g can be equal to either 1 or minus 1 or 0 yeah this is in general possible but we require that the sign of this should not change in other words it should not go from minus 1 to 1 from minus 1 to 1 or 1 to minus 1 as long as it is always 1 or always minus 1 maybe at some points it becomes equal to 0 if the sign of this doesn't change when you check for different x1 x2 points in this region d if these two conditions are satisfied then the bendixson criteria says then d cannot fully contain a periodic orbit there is no periodic orbit that lies entirely in d so another uh, assumption that we had made was that d is a simply connected region so what is a simply connected region so in the plane x1 x2 suppose this is a region d we will call this region d simply connected connected of course means that d should not be made up of two such parts this is in d and this is in d so this is not connected right because 
to, to say that it's connected we take any two points and there should be a curve there should be a path between these two points and the path the points on the path also should lie in d and this should be possible for every two points in d so if d had two components while certain points are connected by a path lying in d every two points are not connected yeah, look at a point there a point here a path from there to here is forced to go outside the set d so this such a set would not be called connected even so for a region that is connected what what do we mean by simply connected so now we take this region d so we take a closed curve inside this yeah, this is just a closed curve and this closed curve can be shrunk to a point yeah we can take a smaller curve slightly smaller curve so and this shrinking can eventually lead to a point and in the process of shrinking to a point inside at no situation does the uh, curve have to leave the set d yeah in other words every closed curve can be shrunk to a point while being inside d if that is a situation if that is a property that d has then we will say d is simply connected yeah so all these regions that we usually think of are indeed simply connected so an example of a set d that is connected but not simply connected is a set with which has holes so take this and we rule out this particular case so what is our d our d is this shaded region and this shaded region without this particular place without this hole so this so this so this d with a hole yeah, this is our d this is an example for region that is connected why it is connected because we can take any two points on the, in d and there is a path that connects these two and all points in the path are also in d but what about a closed curve yeah notice that this closed curve cannot be shrunk cannot be made smaller and smaller such that all the the whole curve is in in d why because it cannot be shrunk to a point yeah so in the process of shrinking this curve to this point to any point it turns out that this hole because it is inside the curve but it is not inside d inside the region d we are not able to shrink this closed curve to a point we might be able to shrink other closed curves to a point but for it for the region d to be simply connected every closed curve we should be able to shrink to a point so there are curves here which we cannot shrink to a point hence this d is not simply connected but this d is simply connected so the bendixson criteria requires that the region d for which we are checking is simply uh, is a simply connected region so on the simply connected region we check whether the two functions whether this function g whether the function g here which is obtained from f1 and f2 by doing this partial derivative operation this g should not be identically zero on this region and it should also not change signs from 1 to minus 1 it is allowed to be zero at a few points in which case the sign is equal to zero that is not of concern but it should not become from 1 to minus 1 or minus 1 to 1 if d satisfies these two properties at all points in d g satisfies these properties then the bendixson criteria says that there is no periodic orbit lying entirely in d what the bendixson criteria does not say is that suppose this is the region g it is simply connected simply connected region d and suppose suppose g was suppose g of the previous slide changes sign changes sign means what when we take different points x1 and x2 then it's equal to 1 at certain x1 x2 points and it's equal to minus 1 hmm? at at some x1 comma x2 it's equal to minus 1 at certain other points yeah at some some at some other points if g is changing its sign from 1 and minus 1 then the bendixson criteria only says us what it says us that there is no such periodic orbit there cannot be such a periodic orbit 
yeah? but there could be a periodic orbit that is not ly lying entirely in D. Yeah? Such a periodic orbit could be there which partly is inside D and partly outside D. Such a periodic orbit st could still exist. The Bendixson criteria does not rule out such periodic er orbits existence. It only rules out any periodic orbit that lies entirely in D. This is ruled out. Yeah? So, please note that there is a subtle difference in uh, lying entirely in D and passing through D and the criteria only says that if G does not change its sign while uh, being checked in D, then there is no periodic orbit that is contained in D. So, let us take an example of a linear system. So, the corresponding matrix A, this can be also written as x dot is equal to A x, where A is equal to 0 1 minus 1 0. So, let us check the eigenvalues for this matrix A. So, determinant of S i minus A is equal to S square plus 1. So, please check that the determinant of this, the characteristic polynomial turns out to be this. So, the eigenvalues of A are plus and minus j. One eigenvalue of A is equal to plus j, the other one is minus j. In other words, there are two eigenvalues both on the imaginary axis, which suggests that there are periodic orbits. This the equilibrium point 0 comma 0 is a center for this particular A. So, let us see what happens to the Bendixson criteria. So, what is our G which we have defined as del f 1 by del x 1 plus del f 2 by del x 2. So, for this particular case, this is our f 1 and this is f 2. So, derivative of f 1 with respect to x 1 is equal to 0 derivative of f 2, x 2 does not even appear in f 2, only x 1 appears. So, derivative of f 2 with respect to x 2 is also again 0, so, this is 0. Yeah? So, no matter which region you take, no matter which simply connected region you take, g of x 1, x 2 is identically equal to 0, it is equal to 0 without even having to specify at which point x 1, x 2 we are checking this. So, so, this is a situation where Bendixson criteria is not applicable. Yeah? So, Bendixson criteria assumptions not satisfied. The assumptions were not satisfied. Does that mean that there are no periodic orbits lying entirely in th inside that simply connected region D? No, it does not mean that. It only means that because the assumptions of the Bendixson criteria are not satisfied, we cannot go ahead and conclude anything because Bendixson criteria is not valid, the statement is not valid. However, we know in this particular case that it is identically 0 and there are periodic orbits indeed. Yeah? In fact, these are all the periodic orbits. So, from any initial condition on this plane, there is a periodic or orbit passing through that. In other words, for every simply connected region that contains the origin, as long as this region is some region like this, there are plenty of periodic orbits. However, Bendixson criteria does not tell us that. Why? Because Bendixson criteria assumes that this G is not identically 0 and that situation is not satisfied here for the case of a linear system with periodic orbits and hence we are not able to use Bendixson criteria here. We will see some more examples of uh, where Bendixson criteria is applicable uh, in the next lectures. Thank you.